We're going to continue forward in our study of Matthew. This morning we are in Matthew 19, a new chapter. And we have a lot to cover this morning, uh, so we had better get after it. We're studying, again, continuing in our study of Matthew's gospel into chapter 19, if you would turn there. And I'm just going to say, one of the things I'm noticing coming out of chapter 17, coming out of the Mount of Transfiguration and heading very rapidly towards the time in Jerusalem, the crucifixion, uh, our Lord is beginning to speak of this more with his disciples in preparation, reiterating to them that this is coming and they're heading in that direction. His teaching is, is taking on, as we saw in Matthew 18, almost a rapid fire uh, aspect in regards to it, where he is just laying out heavy truths in, in very quick succession to his disciples in preparation for this as he continues in his ministry of teaching and, and, and serving the crowds and others. And I say that to say this really from here to the end, there's really not an easy topic Coming out of forgiveness and church discipline, you would kind of think, okay, maybe, maybe chapter 19 will start off a little slower and build back to that, but that's not the case. If you've been reading ahead, you know that in this very beginning 12 verses of this chapter, our Lord deals with what is a great controversy, both then and now, the issue of divorce, remarriage, and singleness. I've entitled this sermon this morning, God's Guidelines for Rocky Marriages. And I have to tell you, we're going to be taking a, a 10,000 foot flyover of this extremely important topic this morning for a couple of reasons. Number one, I want to get through all 12 verses. I don't want to take what is the flow of our Lord's teaching on this very important subject and break it up if I don't have to. So I want to try and get from verse 1 down to verse 12 uh, this morning. And so we have to do so without diving in. The second thing, and, and I, this is a little bit of an endorsement, by God's sweet providence, we have our marriage conference coming up where we will be digging much more into detail on these things than what we're able to do this morning in our limited time. And if you're saying, well, I can't come to the marriage conference or I'm single, but I still want to know about these things, it will all be available online uh, for you as well. But we will be going through this quickly and from a high vantage point. As I considered this, you know, last week I told you that forgiveness is so contrary to what is natural within us. That it makes it one of the best measurements of whether there's something supernatural or, or beyond our natural self living within us. And our Lord uses that and shows us that. But I have to say that here we come again to a, to a struggle that is so great. It, that my experience in this, and, and it's interesting how much we haven't changed, that there's not many issues, if any, that is a greater struggle than this one to not read our own experiences and emotions into Scripture. That this is one of those areas that I think has been so confusing because, as, as I've said many times, when we come to God's Word, if we would but Look at our lives, our emotions, our experiences, our culture surrounding us through the lens of God's word, it would be very clear. But when we instead try and look at God's word through the lens of our emotions, our culture, and our experiences, it brings much confusion. This is certainly one of those areas where we tend to read our own self into it. And I recognize that. And number one, it is an intensely personal reality, meaning that on this subject, those who are experiencing some form of it, emotions run high. It's not something, and rightly so, that is just, yeah, I can handle this. It should never be that. And so in the midst of these types of struggles, emotion run high. The second reason I think that it's so tempting or so difficult to not read into it culture and emotion and experience is because it's sadly practical. And what I mean by that is many are facing it. I, I would actually be surprised if, and I'm not going to, so don't be nervous, but if I were to ask for a show of hands for those who themselves or have very close family uh, or in some way have been affected by this issue of divorce, uh, it is rampant and a struggle within our culture 
And certainly because of that, there are very strong opinions regarding it. And, and so it's sadly practical, meaning many are facing it uh, in some form or another. Maybe it's not you, maybe it's your parents, or maybe it's your children, or a grandchild, or something of that. Because, because of this combination, it's made this almost a hands-off topic. I've actually had people say, hey, let me know when you're going to get to that and I won't come that week. Because they really don't want to know what it says. They've formed their opinions, they've lived their life, and they don't want anything to speak into that, which is this practical, meaning they've walked through it, and this personal, meaning they are very emotional about it. I've personally heard many abuses uh, in regards to the teaching on this, there, there's, there's all kinds of differing things. And I've heard of many other abuses. And I would just encourage our hearts this morning as we're walking through this text of our Lord's teaching. Before we get to all the potential whatabouts. And what I mean by that is, as you know, as we walk through this, you're going to be tempted to say, well, what about if this happens? Or what about this did happen? Or what do we do about this situation? Before we get to the whatabouts. Can we commit this morning to just take this time, this, this short time we have together, and, and just study what it actually says? Then, then we can seek how we might apply it to the whatabouts that will rise up in our minds that we may have already even went through. I think we can agree on this, that the realities of divorce in this generation are clearly against God's design. I don't know of anyone who's been in church for any great length. He's like, man, this way that divorce is handled is really quick, as painless as possible, no fault. Whatever terminology you would use, that that's just a great way that God has given us freedom to do this. I think we all recognize and know that's not the case. That, that the realities of divorce and the mindset of this culture and this generation in regards to it... Uh, are clearly against God's design. And more than that, they are against His will. Amen. I'm reminded of just recently hearing an account of, of a young woman, an adult young woman, who, who was a, one who professed Christ, who claimed to be a Christian, who when asked one time by a young high school girl who was asking about marriage in light of so much failure, she was asking basically, I'm just not sure. If it's even worth it. And this young adult who professed Christ said something along the lines of, Oh, you don't really have to worry about that because you can just get a divorce when it doesn't work out. It wasn't even if it doesn't work out, and we're going to talk about that, but when it doesn't work out, you can just fix it with this. You don't have to be worried about that. We're in a new season. We're more relevant and recognizing of these things. So if it doesn't work out, you're not stuck with it. You can go ahead and enter into it with this mindset. And I share that to help us understand, if you're not aware, maybe as someone of an older generation or someone who's not been touched by this, you don't realize just quite how the culture has come to view this. I would caution us, even though we live in a culture that has clearly gone contrary to God's design and God's will, we are not, as believers, ever permitted to buy into cultural allowances or even cultural norms. I would go further and say that especially in such an environment, we should stay closest to God's word on these subjects so that we might not wander into sin in either direction. And when the majority stands on one side, and we're able to stand with clarity because of God's word and the other. There's not a greater testimony nor light that can shine forth in that. Amen. And so I would, again, just bring these things to bear as we begin to walk through this. In my own life, I've been given no less than... I went through my library and I've been given no less than three different books. Which all take exactly opposite stances to one another. And I can't even begin to count the opinions that have been given to me as it regards to God's view of divorce, remarriage, and singleness. 
usually these opinions have somewhere in the midst of them something along the lines of, well, God wants me to be happy. Or maybe this, God would never want me to be in this situation. So this morning, I just implore you, lay aside the whatabouts, lay aside the cultural norms, lay aside your own view, and let's just consider together what Jesus actually does say on this matter. Read with me Matthew 19, verses 1 to 12. When Jesus had finished these words, he departed from Galilee and came into the region of Judea beyond the Jordan. And large crowds followed him, and he healed them there. Some Pharisees came to Jesus testing him and asking, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any reason at all? And he answered and said, Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? And said, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become One flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. And they said to him, Well, why then did Moses command to give her a certificate of divorce and send her away? He said to them, Because of your hardness of heart, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives, but from the beginning it has not been this way. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for immorality and marries another woman commits adultery. And the disciples said to him, if the relationship of the man with his wife is like this, it is better not to marry. But he said to them, not all men can accept this statement, but only those to whom it has been given. For there are eunuchs who were born that way from their mother's womb, and there are eunuchs who were made eunuchs by men, and there are also eunuchs who made themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. He who is able to accept this, let him accept it. Okay, so there's a lot of information that we just walked through. And again, as I said, I want to do the best we can to get through this in one sermon. Many of the details that I will not be able to cover this morning due to time constraints will be thoroughly examined in our time together at our marriage conference. So with that in mind, let's begin. We're just going to walk through these verses this morning. I broke it down into multiple uh, outline forms. And honestly, at the end of it, I think the best way to walk through this is, is, is take it one step at a time and let it just lead us through it as our Lord's teaching does. The first two verses in 19 are just the author, Matthew's way of transitioning. What we see in this transition is a transition of location and topic. And you'll see this throughout the book of Matthew. We've pointed it out before in past sermons. When, when we get to a place where Matthew records something along the lines of, when Jesus had finished these words, that's a transition statement that Matthew employs quite frequently about five different times prior to this uh, as an author. And so these are just a transition, a transition of location, but also a transition of topic. When Jesus had finished these words, verses 1 and 2, he departed from Galilee, and he came into the region of Judea beyond the Jordan. And large crowds followed him, and he healed them there. Now, we don't want to gloss over this. These verses have value to us, and and we don't have time to look at the geographical realities. I can tell you that he's en route. We're at about the two-year and six-month area of his earthly ministry, which means he is much closer to the cross uh, every moment, and he's heading towards Jerusalem, as he's made clear that is where he must go. Uh, However, he takes a slight detour. Instead of heading straight south to Jerusalem, he heads a little bit east and then south. And and large crowds followed them and he healed them there. Now, this transition is important for us to recognize for multiple reasons. And I would just say this. Having studied this topic in great depth, having come to this text as a major component of teaching on this topic, it is amazing to me how much you miss, how much I miss, compared to when there is a point of in-context, whole-picture study of this text for exposition. 
it's amazing how much more begins to unfold than just coming to this text looking for an understanding of a singular reality. There's so much more in this. So here's a couple things to understand why context is important. The author deemed it important. And we who are seeking to understand and know the text must recognize this. We understand that Scripture is an author-interpreted text. That we don't get to bring our own interpretations, but we seek to know what did the author intend. Ultimately, the author being the Holy Spirit for all Scripture is God-breathed. But using a human vessel, in this case Matthew, to bring this truth to us, what was the intent? Why did this make it in there? Why did he put this in here? Well, I think the, the, the context is important. And so the transition drives context as being new. Chapter 19 does not connect back in a therefore type of way to chapter 18. This is important, and I didn't even recognize the importance myself until I got to the section of commentary study and saw several trying to connect this section back to Jesus' teaching on forgiveness which we just concluded in Matthew 18. And here's what they were saying. They were looking at this text and saying, well, as this flows in context out of his teaching on forgiveness, then Jesus intends that there never be any divorce for any reason, but only a forgiveness and reconciliation, which contradicts what Jesus says in the text. And I was trying to wrap my mind around that. And the importance of the transition makes that much more clear in understanding, okay, this is, this is new. This is not connecting back. This is not flowing out of that. Now, let me say this. Certainly, our Lord demands forgiveness and desires reconciliation. We've looked at that. And certainly, there is no relationship that needs those truths more than marriage. However, that is not the context of this section. It is not the point Here in our text, and the transition the author gives in these two verses makes that absolutely clear so that we can study it rightly and know it accordingly. Matthew sets the scene that Jesus is continuing on in ministry as he has been, ministering to the crowds and preparing his disciples. And guess who shows up again on the scene? Verse 3. These guys have been coming around more and more and more. We saw a delegation sent from Jerusalem to come and try and entrap him. And here it continues still going forward. Verse 3, some Pharisees came to Jesus testing him and asking, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any reason at all? They're continuing to, and again, I put this in quotation marks, to test him. Because they were not testing him for genuineness. They were not testing him to see what he would say so that they might measure it and seek to follow after it if it was accurate. They were testing him as a means to expose him to the multitudes who were following him, to to trap him. There's some things to understand. Number one, he's coming back into Herod's region. We know that Herod had violated all manner of this, which led to the death of John the Baptist. And so if they could get Jesus sideways with Herod, maybe he would take care of this Jesus the way he did John the Baptist, and they wouldn't have to deal with it. Also in that, there's a little, there's a little background to understand the teaching uh, of this time. There were two basic schools of thought. And this is what's amazing to me, that back in this day, it's really not very far removed from our day. But there were two basic schools of thoughts regarding this issue of divorce. There there was a liberal one and a conservative one. And there were two main teachers with a whole lot of others thrown in the mix, but two main ones that, that kind of represented the liberal and the conservative view for Judaism as it pertains to the issue of divorce and remarriage. Rabbi Hillel was the liberal one. And he took the stance that Mosaic law commanded divorce of your wife for any reason whatsoever. Now, this led had led to an environment of of quickie divorce and remarriage stemming from all kinds of things, but predominantly from a man's desire to marry another woman. And what this did, as we see oftentimes in the Pharisaical view, it gave them an out for how to accomplish this while still maintaining their facade of righteousness. We're well within the law. And one of the things that cropped up, it was fascinating to read this, multiple other rabbis under each of these camps 
would then take a, a slightly different stance upon it, some more liberal than others, and so followers would come who desired what they were teaching. Again, it's a, it's a 2 Timothy 4. That those who don't love the Lord will accumulate for themselves teachers after their own lust. That will basically say to them, yeah, it's great to do what you want to do. Oh, you don't like that? Go see this guy. He'll fulfill or give you permission for that. Uh, to give you some examples, Rabbi Hillel had taken the stance that uh, you could divorce your wife. And the basic power structure in this culture was predominantly within the man. Not only, we see in 1 Corinthians 7, there are commands for the wives to also not leave, not divorce, but the basic structure of this lay with the man. And you'll recognize that in the gender-specific uh, pronouns and things that the Lord uses. But in this, he had said, for example, if your wife burns your toast and it displeases you, you can write her a certificate of divorce and find another. It went further, and in even other small, seemingly inconsequential areas, they would even say, under his teaching, that you were commanded to if there was that displeasure in your life. Now, under him, as is always the case, others became more and more radicalized, if you can imagine that, to the degree that one rabbi's teaching that I read literally taught that Mosaic law allowed for the divorce of your wife if you saw another prettier and desired her, you could divorce your wife because she had become displeasing to you. It's amazing to see the depth of... When you understand that they're willing to write that down and say it out loud, it begins to give you at least a little glimpse of the culture and how far astray it had actually become. On the other side of this coin, we have uh, another rabbi, and there's two different spellings. I'm not sure which one is accurate as I research this. Uh, rabbi uh, Shemai or Shemil, he was much more conservative to the point of swinging completely the other direction. He taught that divorce was never allowable for any reason. And what I want you to understand on this background is this topic was extremely controversial in other words, when they came and sought to test or trap Jesus, there's a specific reason for it. It was extremely controversial and I would say extremely relevant, meaning everyone had an opinion. Much like in our generation, most of us in some form sadly have been touched by this reality and have had to form an opinion of this is what I think in regards to this, and so this subject was not one that you could throw into a crowd that would not create strong response. It was extremely controversial, it was extremely relevant, meaning the whole crowd was affected, and it was extremely divisive. There wasn't any middle ground, that's why there were so many different upcroppings of this. There's no real middle ground on this area. There, there were those who said no from a distance and those who had come to believe yes through experience and other things. And we can see the same thing today. In other words, whichever side Jesus upheld was going to cause the other side of the crowds to oppose him. This is not an issue that they were able to say, well, we can agree to disagree, but Jesus is great. This is an area that when Jesus takes a stand was so controversial, so relevant, and so divisive. And the Pharisees knew this, which is why they sought to test or trap him in this area before the crowds. Because if he answers, no matter what he answers, it's going to create a division among those who are seeking after him. This is nothing new, by the way. As I was reading this, it just struck me. It's nothing new. It's certainly ongoing today within the church regarding difficult topics. I, I can well remember an incident here at this church prior to my being the pastor where a brother was testing me on my view of the end times. I naively in the moment believed it was a legitimate conversation and not a testing, and so I engaged in it. It pretty quickly became clear as the other man began waving his Bible over his head, stomping in a circle and shouting as he sought to make his point. 
More than that, I realized there was somewhat of a setup there as he called his family members who were the only ones standing around and asked them if they had heard what he, is infer- he was inferring he had heard. I just remember thinking, what is going on? And I think it's the same thing that we see here. It's not a new tactic. It's a, let me put this out there and make sure that I can get it in such a way that the response brings division. It's certainly still ongoing. And I say that to say this. This is a difficult subject. It's controversial. It's divisive. It's relevant. Exactly the same way it was when Christ himself was tested in order to be trapped by the Pharisees in it. I do not want to get caught up in such a thing. But I also want to be absolutely clear in regards to where we stand as a church on these matters. And by God's grace, I believe that we can do that this morning. It's important for you to know on topics of great importance. Those are the hardest ones to address. And it's important that they be addressed humbly and clearly And as in all things, standing boldly upon God's word and his word alone. Because of that, we're going to be focusing primarily here in this text. There are other teachings. 1 Corinthians 7 deals with this. Uh, Multiple places in scripture will deal to some degree with this. From the book of Ezra uh, to 1 Corinthians 7 to this teaching in Matthew 19. To what we've already looked at in the Lord's Sermon on the Mount of Matthew chapter 5. But I want to walk simply through this because I believe it is absolutely clear in what it says and it truly is a sufficient answer for almost every situation we'll face in regards to this. So the Pharisees have set this trap. Now I think we know what our Lord's going to do. He's consistently done the same thing in every situation. He's going to respond with scripture. This is an example for us continually. We are so tempted, I think, at times to respond with logic, reason, experience, emotion, and every other thing. But our Lord sets this example continually in the gospel accounts, and we should pay attention to it. He responds with Scripture. Look at verses 4 down to 6. And he answered them and said, Have you not read... I love that statement. To the Pharisees, the the teachers and keepers of the law. Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? And said, for this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let no man separate What our Lord does is he begins to confront this testing, this desire to trap him, by first and foremost defining what it is they are discussing, which is marriage. I find this very helpful when dealing with difficult, emotional, and often convoluted issues, even in my own heart. The first thing that I want to do is establish what has the Lord said. Before I start taking what I think and then trying to find the proof text that accommodates what I think. I want to take the time to say, okay, God, what have you said on this matter? And so we see that and recognize that. And our Lord, he takes the time to to define accurately. And he does so. He goes to the beginning. We don't get to jump in the middle. He goes to the beginning and establishes what is the actual definition, what is God's design in marriage before even continuing forward. And he will answer them, as we read earlier, and you'll see in a little bit. But he begins here by defining it. He takes them back to the beginning, and he rightly defines what marriage is. Now, again, we will spend, this is the area we will spend much more time on in our conference, a right understanding of marriage by God's design and provision. But Jesus makes absolutely clear what what marriage is. From the beginning, it's never been in question. It's not in question now. And it's interesting to me, you'll notice when the Lord deals with controversial subjects, he doesn't say to them, now guys, prepare yourself, this is going to be really hard. He, he never gives that caveat, that, that outlet. He just says, this is, what it's, this is what it says. Why are we even having this conversation? This, this is what it says. Do you not know what it says? 
And he does that. He takes them back to the beginning and defines it. And there's three things that stand out to me about marriage according to God's definition affirmed and upheld by our Lord Christ here. Number one, it is between a man and a woman. It's between a man and a woman. This is the design of our Lord. It is the clarity being upheld by our Lord. And I would say for greatest clarity, sadly, that we even need to establish this, but a person's gender is established by the one who created them. Amen. In the beginning, he created them, male and female. It is not established by their desire at any point. I say this, it's not intended to be controversial. Our Lord dealt with controversial things and he never himself made them controversial. He just said, this is what it is. And I say the same thing to you. This is what it is. And it's not said to be shocking. It's not said to fly in the face of culture. Scripture does that well on its own without me needing to do it from here. Simply recognizing what it says is not to be controversial. But I would say this, it's intensely practical. It's necessary. When it comes to these matters, you you need to understand why we are who we say we are, what we will be, what we will do, all those things. And also, as a pastor, having to counsel and walk through truth in a culture that is contrary, I need to know what it says so that I can stand with conviction firmly upon it, no matter what comes through, through my door at any given time or through your door, possibly, as a believer. This is intentionally practical because when it comes to these matters, this is an area that the state may recognize a union that is not between a man and a woman as a marriage, but we will not. That's it. This is the reason why. There's never going to be a time when that changes for from the beginning. Have you not read? This is God's design. In the beginning, he created them. Male and female, he created them. So when it comes to the conversation surrounding marriage, there's really not a conversation. There's a going back to this establishment and understanding it rightly. The teaching here on divorce and remarriage has no bearing whatsoever on a union that is not a marriage by God's definition at the foundation of it. Why is that important? Well, for a multitude of reasons. Some we'll get to in a moment, but I'll just say this to you very simply. If by God's grace... Someone who has been in that situation due to sin and rebellion is saved by that grace and redeemed unto a new creation. And they come seeking to understand what do I do with my state-recognized union or marriage in light of Matthew 19. It's an easy answer. It never was. And therefore we move forward honoring the Lord in these things. It doesn't matter what culture does. It doesn't matter what the state says if it's a contradiction to God's word. That's intensely practical and necessary for my heart as a shepherd, for your heart as a believer. These are things that we need to recognize in simplicity. There's so much confusion. People will come to me and say, man, I had this conversation and they were making all these points from the Bible about this and that. Did they deal with this? Well, no, I don't remember that coming up. Well, did they recognize? No. We need to know these things at the foundation and not get caught up in cultural struggles that are not even remotely able to be defended. This lends itself to great and easy clarity in an area which is not and will not be easy to see clearly in the future. Some of you who are here, you might have grown up in a culture that this was not confusing. And so you look at those around you and expect that they would have the same clarity just naturally that you have. But I want you to know that that your children and grandchildren are growing up in a culture that makes this a very confusing subject. It has been confused in multiple ways with precision and has been done so on purpose. And so we need simple clarity. And God's word offers that to us. I was just reading an article this week where one of our presidential candidates has said at a, at a recent meeting that he believes that any religious group that does not, in his words, toe the line in upholding the government's view on marriage and the uh, LGBTQ community's uh, agenda should be added to a terrorist watch list. I'm thankful that if that does happen in the face of those struggles... I'm thankful that our Lord 
has so clearly established where we as his followers are to stand on this issue so that I don't have to, in the moment, try and figure out what should my response to be. We can be equally clear, even when it seems as though the, the church is caving left and right on this issue, we can center and uphold God's word as the authority, which it certainly is, because whose word is it? This is what we have to continually preach and remind ourselves of. This bears his authority because it's his word. And as his citizens, as children of his kingdom, as everything we've been learning, this is our ultimate authority. And so we need to know what it says with clarity and, and simplicity. And I am so thankful for that. The second truth about marriage that our Lord upholds here is that marriage is a completely new structure which the couple is beginning in their lives and it is intended to divide or separate them from their old one and unite them to their new one. Listen, this one is equally important just in a simple defining way. When a couple desires to be married, a young couple or generally in this we see it as a young couple because of the caveat with parents, it says this, look, you want the privileges and responsibilities of marriage? Then you need to be ready to step into them when you get married. This is so important in an environment, in a culture which has said, marriage is like not really that important. We can, we can play at marriage. We'll, we'll date in a way that looks like marriage. Or we will practice marriage without actually committing to marriage. And so it's whittled away and whittled away and whittled away at this understanding of, of God's design. This is a new structure. And for you to pursue marriage means that you must be at a place that is ready to be married. With all the privilege and responsibilities that marriage brings with it. It's a new structure. It's a new life. It's not just a, a merging of the old and new, which is sadly what we oftentimes see. This is something different. This is where a man leaves his father and mother and cleaves unto his wife. And the two of them become one flesh. They become a new union. They become a new structure. Something they have not been and now are. It is a new structure of authority. It is a new structure of responsibility and you are being transferred from the family you were born into to the new one which you have now chosen. And this needs to be said. Mom and dad uphold and support this or recognize that you are in sin by contradicting God's plan and putting your own in place. Young couples who are married recognize and support this or also recognize that if you are contradicting it, what you are saying is, God, your plan is not as good as my plan, which I think all of us should be wise enough to know we should never say. It is a new structure. It is a brand new life. It does not mean that you completely separate out from your family that you were born into. Of course not. But it must be that which is new. And our Lord makes that clear in his definition of marriage that's given here. Have you not read? For this reason, marriage being this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and shall cleave unto his wife and the two shall become one flesh. The third thing we see is that this is accomplished by and under God's authority and not man's. This goes back to again. What will we recognize in regards to marriage? God's definition, because marriage is given by him, defined by him, accomplished by him. It doesn't matter what the court rules or doesn't matter what the law of the land says. If it contradicts God's design and commands, it is therefore contrary, contrary to him and his authority. And I would just say this, for we who profess Christ, would we ever willingly find ourselves contrary to God's design, plan, and authority? I can only say to you, you should never want to be there. We would never willingly find ourselves or, or place ourselves in a, in a contradiction to the things that God has given and commanded and made clear. He makes clear that because of number three, separation is not a good thing. It's sin. What God hath joined together, let no man 
separate, let no man put asunder. It's the conclusion of probably every one of our weddings that we've been a part of here. There's always this statement recognized from this text, what God hath joined together, let no man put asunder. This is the, these are the three basics of Jesus' definition, but we need to understand because of number three, separation is not a good thing. It is sin. Now, we're going to define that more fully in a moment, but it must be seen as such. We don't get to beat around this bush, so to speak. We need to see it as he calls it. What God hath joined, let no man unjoin. Now, what we are about to see in our Lord's teaching is it does not mean that both individuals in a broken or separated marriage are in sin, but certainly we must recognize that sin is present for the union to be broken, and that is always a tragedy. If we don't see that coming out of this, then we're not seeing this rightly. We need to understand this, that there's never a place where divorce is a good thing Because a divorce represents sin's presence, unrepentance, and destruction on display. There's no way that we can see it any other way. No matter what culture says, no matter what the law allows, no matter what our friends and others may tell us, this is clear. It is always a representation of sin. Now, it doesn't mean that both parties are in sin, but for divorce to happen, it means that sin has happened period. Now the Pharisees were ready as any good trap setter is. They they were ready for his response and in verse 7 we see what they were unloading on him for they said to him why then did Moses command to give her a certificate of divorce and send her away? Man these guys are really something. They twist the truth unashamedly and never seem to learn. They don't get it. They've been coming before Christ and he's been confronting them with the same thing constantly. You might say that, but let me tell you what I say. And what we recognize looking back that lends so much to this is the right understanding that Jesus Christ is what? He is the Word made flesh. These are his words that they're quoting to him and having twisted that. They have continually confronted Jesus with their version of his words from the Old Testament. And he has continually corrected their perversion of truth. I've said this before, but the more I study this, I am amazed that there is not a fireball somewhere in here that the Lord calls upon to just deal with this once and for all. I'm recognizing again my own rebellion and constantly desiring and deciding, but Lord, what about? But Lord, what about this? But Lord, I know you said that, but this. But Lord, you didn't know what she was going to be like. But Lord, you didn't really know what he was going to act like or else you would have never wrote this. We have all of these things that we bring through our own focus that confuses this. And then we end up with a place where Satan is able to run rampant as our enemy twisting to our own destruction our views on this. These Pharisees blow my mind. They come to Jesus and they misquote totally this section. All commentators agree that they are referencing the text in Deuteronomy 24. Turn with me quickly to Deuteronomy 24. I just want to read it. We who have been taught to look for context. We who have been taught to study to know. Not to seek simply to find our way. In Deuteronomy 24, Moses giving out the structure and law for the children of Israel addresses this issue. And they take one small section in it, as we saw earlier, when it says Moses' command. And if you look in your Bible, that should not be in the same italics or in the same uh, type as, as the part where it says, Give her a certificate of divorce and send her away. That part is an accurate quote, totally ripped out of context, totally robbed of the surrounding words. Listen to verses 1 through 4 of Deuteronomy 24. When a man takes a wife and marries her, and it happens that she finds no favor in his eyes because he has found some indecency in her, and he writes her a certificate of divorce and puts it in her hand and sends her out from his house, and she leaves his house and goes and becomes another man's wife. 
Now, there's a lot happening there that, that we don't have time to fully get into, but, but I just want you to read this and ask yourself, what's actually the subject? What's actually being said? What we have here is Moses saying, look, there's a situation where there's a marriage, and in that, there's something that breaks that marriage. And in that, the man writes a certificate of divorce, which keeps the wife, uh, his, his wife from suffering under the law, which commands that adultery brings forth death. And so he writes her a certificate of divorce, puts it in her hand, and sends her out from his house. And she leaves his house, and she goes and gets remarried. Okay. So this happens, and the latter husband turns against her and writes her a certificate of divorce and puts it in her hand and sends her out of his house. Or if the latter husband dies, who took her to be his wife? Then her former husband, who sent her away, is not allowed to take her again to be his wife. Since she has been defiled, for that is an abomination before the Lord, and you shall not bring sin on the land which the Lord your God gives you as an inheritance. How on earth did the Pharisees get from this section that divorce is allowable for any and every reason? Moses commanded it, and therefore we're going to practice it. First thing. Moses did not command divorce, but he regulated it so that Israel would see rightly the weight of it. He regulated it so that those who were innocent in the midst of the brokenness and the sin of it would be protected. He did so because of the hardness of their hearts. And what Moses is actually dealing with is, look, if you divorce her for indecency, then he needs to understand she ain't coming back. We do not live in an environment, nor should we ever live in an environment where there's the mindset that was given to that young high school girl. Look, if it doesn't work out, you just divorce. It doesn't matter. You're not tethered. We live in a time when it doesn't matter. It, whatever happens, happens. And if it, later you decide, you can always go back. No, Moses makes clear. Look, if you move forward with this, it's done. There's no going back on this. There's no backing backpedaling on this and it's important to understand that's the context we, I don't have time to explain all of Deuteronomy 24 to you this morning we need to get back to Matthew but I do want to look at the way the Pharisees had perverted that was not the context that was not the teaching we need to understand this now in a moment the one who is the word himself having become flesh meaning Jesus he's about to clarify what is intended by indecency He's going to clarify that. In case you're trying to figure it out and go back to the Hebrew and those things, let's just be clear. When Jesus said this is what God's law means, then it applies to all of it. We can understand clearly what indecency is meaning here when Jesus himself clarifies that in a moment. But what we see is the Pharisees taking a passage and again abusing it. Moses was dealing with the proper understanding of remarriage after a divorce. And the divorce itself was not the point. Hey, that wasn't the point. It was not for any and all reasons. It was for clearly for specific reasons. But the Jews in the desire to fulfill their lusts had read it as they wanted to. And in verse 8, our Lord corrects their wrong view. He said to them, Because of your hardness of heart, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning, it has not been this way there's three things that happen here in this verse. As we saw earlier, three definitions given by our Lord of marriage. Here, here we have three things happening in this verse 8. Number one, Jesus corrects them that divorce happened because of their hard hearts, not because of other things that they saw in their wives. Secondly, Jesus corrects that Moses per permitted it, but certainly did not command it. And thirdly, Jesus upholds the high view of marriage that he had just reminded them of from Genesis in the beginning. He doesn't back down on that. He doesn't say your hardness of heart trumps God's design. He never would do that, and he certainly does not do that here. And this is important because we need to understand that divorce is not God's design. More than that, it is a contradiction to it, which is brought about by sin. And we are those who should and must hate sin, period. Marriage must not be defined by the brokenness of our condition. It cannot be. It must not be defined by the brokenness of our condition. Hardened hearts are a horrible condition to be in. And divorce is always a result of a hardened heart. It is not a freedom, but it is a tragedy. Always. Always. It is not to be celebrated. It is to be mourned. 
as a tragedy that has been, a, that has been done. Listen, it is not to be seen as an escape clause, but as a never going to happen as much as it depends on me reality. This is what our Lord's teaching. Hey, this is what Moses has said. This is what our Lord clarifies. Secondly, in Moses' permission and in Jesus' recognition of it, this is where I want us to hear this well. We see that, in fact, divorce, while never commanded nor endorsed, is permitted. It is. That's one of the great controversies. That's one of the great views that struggles is, is there are those who, who like the Rabbi Shamil and into our day, divorce is never permitted. No, divorce is never commanded. Divorce is never encouraged. Divorce is never endorsed. But it is permitted. This shuts down the argument that divorce is never allowable. And this must be that which shapes our understanding of that question. God's word and his alone. But so too does God does recognizing God's design from the beginning shape our understanding. We, we don't get to grab that and say, oh, he allows it. There's my outlet I've been looking for. No, it's very specific, and, and we have to take all of it. And recognizing God's design from the beginning, which Jesus has already established and then reiterates here, upholding it that this is not how it's meant to be, is important and also shapes our understanding. So too does our recognition that this is only permitted when the hardness of one of the party's hearts demands it. This is not commanded. It's permitted. It's, it's permitted in this alone. This cuts two ways. Uh, you need to hear this. If there is a hard-hearted person who has sinned against the marriage and is unrepentant or still hard in their heart, then we see divorce as permissible for the protection of the one whom their hardness of heart is harming. Absolutely. But let me say this. If there is sin which has damaged the relationship, but repentance is proven and displayed, then the injured party must not be hard-hearted, but rather recognize that divorce is not commanded and God hates it. Now I know that somewhere around here is where all the whatabouts come in. I know that. But I believe if we rightly view this, it will shape our direction in this difficult matter. I believe this principle is clear. And through careful shepherding, a biblical understanding of any and all situations can accurately be arrived at. The Lord in his grace has given us his word that we might know his will. And then he's given shepherds to the church that they might walk through these things teaching with clarity and guiding and protecting, overseeing those whom have been entrusted as Christ's under shepherds for this time here in this life. Amen. We can come to a biblical understanding in every situation. If your marriage is on a rocky path, then it is because of one or more hardened heart in it. In counseling, I, just to give you a picture, we'll deal with this condition in very simple ways. I'm a very simple person by God's grace. And so dealing with this condition, we do so by exposing the sin. If there's rockiness in the marriage, there's sin in the marriage. And so we will work to expose the sin and pursue faith and repentance in regards to whatever is exposed. Secondly, we will work to protect the innocent and rebuke the one who is guilty. It will be difficult, yes. But it is so worth it because of the tragedy that not doing this represents. We will call both parties to a soft heart which trusts and honors the Lord. Let me say it in this way. We believe as a church, we need to be clear, that divorce is tragic and always due to sin. And we would never endorse nor encourage it. You will never come into a counseling session on marriage where you will hear me or one of our other elders endorsing nor encouraging divorce. However, we believe that when it affords protection from the damage of another's hardened heart, then it is permissible. 
In the next verse, our Lord gives them the definitive answer they were looking for. And he gives us clarity as well into the narrowness of permissible divorce. Verse 9, And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife, except for immorality, and marries another woman, commits adultery. In this verse, our Lord makes clear that what is in view in the permission for divorce, both in Deuteronomy 24 and now also, was that which has violated the intimacy of the marriage relationship. Now, as you look at your copy of God's Word, some translations say adultery. Others, like the New American Standard, say immorality. Some say fornication. Some say unchastity. Some say impurity. The Greek word that is here, that is translated all of those ways, is the word pornea. You might recognize it as the root word for our modern day word pornography. And what it speaks to very clearly when you look at the usage in the New Testament is sexual perversity. It's oftentimes used to describe prostitution. It is used to describe adultery. And it is used at times in Revelation to describe runaway immorality. These are all possibilities under this word group. However, I pray that we can all recognize it is extremely more narrow than any and every reason. And I would say that the weight Jesus has rightly applied to the marriage covenant, we should recognize it as addressing unrepentant hardness of heart in sin against the intimacy of the marriage relationship, specifically in sexual perversion. Now there is other teaching on abandonment in some other areas. And in Scripture we clearly see a continued protection for those who are innocent. A calling to these things from the New Testament forward. And so I am not saying this is the only. What I am saying, it is extremely narrow. God hates divorce. He gives permission for, but never a command for. And that we need to rightly see this. And for our time this morning... We're in Matthew 19, and this is what the Lord says very clearly. Any divorce not adhering to this is likely a non-permissible divorce. And I say that to say this, truly, when you find that you have that or any sin in your life, repentance needs to be sought, and the Lord is faithful to forgive This sin is not beyond his grace. But if you are stubborn and hard-hearted and unwilling to call it sin, he will not give forgiveness. You need to seek that. I would go further and say this. The idea that this adultery is some special sin that is perpetual and therefore unforgivable. Or the absurd idea in contradiction to Deuteronomy 24 and in contradiction to all that we've just learned about the marriage relationship that somehow you must divorce the one you have possibly remarried and go seek the spouse of your youth as being that which Jesus is teaching is not what is being taught. Now I know That because this issue is so divisive and controversial, that landing with clarity will likely alienate some. I can only promise that our motivation is to honor the Lord and that I am certainly open to walking through these convictions with an open Bible and examining the text to see. To the degree that I will change these convictions that I carry if there is any contradiction in what has been said. So with that, Here's some clarity, a few guidelines that we recognize. CVC, Community Baptist Church, will never perform same-sex marriages. Sex being determined by creation recognized at birth. CVC will not perform unequally yoked marriages, recognizing that God calls that sin, and so too shall we. CVC will not perform living in sin marriages. It's a hard one. There's been a tradition, I think, for some time that says if you're living in sin, get married and it'll fix it. It's not biblical. It's not true. It won't. 
Understand this, marriage by God's design and command requires sacrifice and commitment. Amen. Which one who is unwilling to honor the Lord in that sacrifice and commitment prior to the altar will not likely honor him after the altar. It's a hard one, but it's one that we call men to recognize. And number four, we will never perform unbiblical divorce remarriages. An example of that, so you have clarity, is if a spouse leaves another in order to pursue a new spouse, they will not be getting married within the confines of this church. We will never counsel for divorce, but rather always seek faith and repentance. However, where there is clear permissibility from Scripture, we will not stand in the way of that. Stand in the way means we will not bring church discipline against someone who is seeking a permissible divorce, whereas we most certainly would against someone who is seeking a non-permissible divorce. Moses allowed for divorce and remarriage, but not as a good thing. But due to the hardness of hearts, he permitted it as a bad thing. Our Lord here upholds that and makes allowances, although he keeps those allowances very narrow, as is right in the face of God's design for marriage. But it is allowed. There are those who say it is never allowed. It's a contradiction to this text. Some say that it should never be allowed. But if it does happen, then remarriage is never allowed. We recognize that none of it is desirable nor mandated. But that both divorce and remarriage are permissible within biblical narrowness. If you have experienced an unbiblical divorce and you have repented from it and sought forgiveness from the Lord and you have a spouse or your spouse whom you have departed from is living and not remarried and you yourself have not remarried, then we would counsel seeking reconciliation and remarriage with them. If they have died or if you have remarried or if they have remarried, or if they refuse to consider remarriage to you, then we believe that you are free in that. You need to repent if it was an unbiblical divorce. You need to repent if there was sin, if you were the hard-hearted party. You need to get past that before the Lord, and you need to do all that he has commanded that displays the genuineness of that repentance. If you are married, then honor the Lord daily, love them fiercely, forgive them frequently, and enjoy. Enjoy. It's a gift that he's given. And the disciples, don't worry, I'll close with prayer and we won't close in a song, although we certainly would need to, possibly. But we have to get through this last section. The disciples recognizing all of the mess of their culture and the ugliness of hardened hearts abounding around them, expressed what is a logical mindset to outcome from this. Listen to verse 10. The disciples said to him, If the relationship of a man with his wife is like this, it's better not to marry. You know, in a, any and every reason culture which they were in and which we were in, with the recognition that Jesus has just brought of the permanence and sacrifice necessary to make it work, they were disheartened. They were disheartened. And certainly, I know that probably each of us here have to some degree felt that disheartenment. Maybe for our children, maybe for ourselves. They were disheartened. If it really is okay to just get out whenever you want to, then it's really not that weighty to get into. And so you might as well. But with our Lord's teaching and they're looking around, they responded somewhat dejectedly. If this is the way it is, then it's better just not. It's better to not even get into this relationship, which is so important 
and yet so broken in our time. This was the wrong response. I want you to hear me. If you're here today and because of pain in your life or because of the brokenness around us or because of whatever you are saying it's better not to, it's a wrong response. Our Lord makes clear in the final two verses. He said to them, not all men can accept this statement, but only those to whom it has been given. For there are eunuchs who were born that way from their mother's womb. Jumping down, listen, it is a gift. Singleness and the ability to maintain this, what the disciples asked about, is a gift which is given to specific individuals to be single. And he gives us three categories. He's gone in threes here. From birth, some will have no desire for marriage, relationship, and intimacy. That will be clear. And I've actually met one person in my life that had that gift. Number two, some who were made this way by others. Possibly literally, as this was a common practice in the culture and age of biblical times. Or perhaps to consider today, having been married and abandoned or hurt. Or having looked at those who were. Or possibly in a marriage that was sufficient for their lifetime. Even though the other has passed, a person now has no desire for marriage. That could be a category where this would apply. And thirdly, those who commit themselves to kingdom work and focus so completely upon it that the marriage desire fades through this commitment. This would be very specific. It would be very clear in this and there are no other categories that fit this and so if you are not one of these categories then trust God in your singleness that he will fulfill that desire as he has said he will and love marriage protect it in your singleness and wait for the one whom God will provide when his timing is right so there you have a 10,000 foot view of God's guidelines for rocky marriages I pray and hope that these principles will serve most fully to point each of us to the Lord this morning as we recognize that marriage most definitely displays how much we need him in this life. I'm going to pray, and uh, we have some folks who are, who are coming to be joined with us. I told them to come forward in the song, and since we're not singing a song, I want to be clear and not cause confusion. As I pray, if you're one who is joining us this morning, if you would make your way to the front row, and I'll introduce you to the congregation then. Lord, we are so thankful for the clarity of your word that it so divides and rightly and clearly tells us how we are to live in a world that can be confusing, in flesh that is contrary, and desires and emotions that can run roughshod over us. We can come and cling to your word. We can open it and be rightly recognizing of the fullness of, of what you have commanded and what you have not. Lord, we can have that clarity and as your children, we can obey it, examining our lives and the situations and circumstances and emotions and all that we bring to the table through the clarity of your word. Lord, I pray that even today, that if there's sin in someone's life that has been unrepentant of, maybe for many years, Maybe it's one that's being considered, Lord, that your truth would prick them to the heart of who they are. And Lord, that they would come to you seeking forgiveness and repentance. And Lord, that you, as you have promised and are faithful, will forgive them and cleanse them from any and all unrighteousness. Lord, I pray that there would not be a hindrance through unbiblical teaching to the pursuit of these things. And Lord, I pray that if there be any questions, Lord, that your word would direct them and that you would use your servant as you see fit in that. Lord, we love you, we thank you, and ask all of this in Christ's name. Amen.